Okay, so let me thank the organizers for inviting me to speak at this conference. I'll be talking about this project on semi-classical black hole microstates, and in particular how to use them to count the microcanonical dimension in gravity, as well as um, some of its applications to show Hilbert space factorization in gravity. This is based on work in progress with collaborators at UPenn, as well as the UB, and it's also very heavily based on these other projects by uh, all these folks. And let me begin by saying that this uh, microcanonical dimension computation was originally done in this very first paper, what we are doing is mostly extending it to other settings. And the consideration of the Hilbert space factorization was done in JT Gravity very recently in this paper. And what we are trying to do currently is to extend it to higher dimensional, a higher dimensional discussion. So let me begin with a quick introduction. Um, why microstates? Well, famously black holes have entropies. And in particular, when you have entropy, you should think microstates and microstates counting. So for example, if we have a microcanonical black hole with some energy E, you should think of its entropy as counting the, the dimension of the microcanonical Hilbert space in whatever gravity theory it is defined in. And so the, the um, definition and counting of black hole microstates is a very interesting area uh, of study. I will be focusing today, and there's many different approaches, but what I'll be focusing on today is specifically attempts at doing this semi-classically. This was started by Corcola Maldacena when they studied these pure states that are defined on a single copy of the CFT, which one could uh, build from some Cardi um, boundary states and then evolving by Euclidean time evolution. And these states have a nice geometric dual, which look like black holes with end of the world brains behind them. Uh, because these things, because these, these states, the geometric duals look exactly like black holes outside of the horizon, then these are very nice candidates for uh, microstates of the black hole because they're indistinguishable to simple probes of the state. However, there's an infinite number of these states that one could build, and they seem to be orthogonal, at least at the leading order um, computation. So this is a very severe overcounting of the true dimension of the microcanonical Hilbert space. What I'll be talking about today is how this can be fixed by carefully uh, including wormhole uh, contributions in the um, semi-classical computation. The story that I'll tell is actually quite general, but for conciseness, I'll be focusing on uh, ADS safety uh, with two asymptotic boundaries. And so in particular, we can start with two copies of holographic CFT defined on a sphere, and we can build states that look like this, uh, which are generalizations of a thermal field double, which could be prepared by an Euclidean path uh, integral preparation, where the uh, Euclidean, um, Euclidean time uh, preparation is sort of interrupted in the middle by the insertion of a spherical, spherically symmetric operator with formal dimension O. Because of the insertion of the operator, there's actually two different Euclidean uh, time evolutions in the preparation of the state. These states have actually nice geometric duals. They look essentially like this picture over here, where in the bottom we have the Euclidean uh, preparation, which look like two um, Euclidean black holes glued together along the trajectory of some <laughs> spherical distribution of matter. The, the trajectory that the spherical distribution takes is solved by these conditions, which conditions, look, which looks a little bit like this. And the main thing that I want to emphasize is that at the t equals zero slice, it looks like a Einstein-Rosen bridge that has been extended because of the presence of this spherical distribution of matter inside of it. Because we had two different Euclidean time evolutions, the uh, geometries on either side can have different uh, masses, so they're black holes of different mass. And one thing that I'll mention is that if you keep the difference in the masses fixed and you start decreasing the mass of the shell that's inside of the wormhole, the wormhole <laughs> starts shrinking because there's less matter back reacting until eventually, at some critical mass, it reaches the insertion of one of the position of one of the two uh, horizons. If we keep decreasing the mass of this shell, we end up getting something we end up getting something that looks like this, where at the t equals zero slice, we have a double-sided black hole with some lower mass, where on specifically one of the two sides, there's a spherical distribution of matter, which upon Lorentzian time evolution falls into the black hole and increases its mass by some definite amount, delta m. These are the, the states that I'll be considering. Um, and now let's talk about what type of computations we can do with them. So in particular, we can compute their overlaps using the Euclidean gravitational path integral. The idea is that the brass and the cats are, are prepared through some CFT path integral, which can then, we can then find the overlap by doing a gravitational path integral subject to those uh, to appropriate boundary conditions. In the semi-classical approximation, what we have to do is just find the classically allowed solutions that fill those boundary conditions. And it is just given by the sum 
over those shells and sorry over those configurations and e to the minus on shell action of these of these contributions for example this is what would compute the norm squared of the state we can then ask for example what happens with two states that have different masses m and n um, in particular if m and n are the same we get the same ex expression that i showed before but if the masses are macroscopically different there are actually no solutions that fill in these boundary conditions and so what one would conclude is that at leading order in the semi-classical expansion the states are orthogonal this is the tension that i was referring to they seem to be orthogonal at leading order in the semi-classical semi -classical approximation and moreover we can build an infinite number of these by simply increasing the mass by some fixed amount yeah question is there a calculation that doesn't involve pictures or just equations yes but I, I don't really have time in 15 minutes to. You will find it in the, in the paper when it comes out. It's not out yet. But in previous papers, there's also calculations. OK. Uh, We are so the overbar means that we're computing it by, a, by a, an approximation in which we're using a gravitational path interval, and we're also doing a semi-classical approximation to compute that path interval. Yeah. So in principle, if you, you would remove the overbars by doing a full quantum gravity computation, which we don't, it's not accessible to us. OK, so this is the, the res this is, OK, so this apparent tension is resolved from the fact that there's actually a very small amount of overlap between the states. Uh, the magnitude can actually be estimated by uh, wormhole contributions like this. So for example, if we take the magnitude squared of the overlaps and we uh, you do the semi-classical approximation to find it, we find a leading term that is only there when the, when the masses are equal, and that's consistent with the norm square that we were just computing. Uh, but even if the, if the masses are different, there's still a non-vanishing contribution, which is suppressed by factors of e to the s. But this tells us that there's, there are very small off-diagonal di terms in the overlap between these, these states. And we can keep having more information about this by doing the computation higher uh, boundary wormholes uh, like this, where there's something here that doesn't vanish even if all these masses are macroscopically different. OK, so there's this uh, usual question of why is it that things don't really factorize. And there's a, a solution that has already been addressed, I think, by Jan de Boer and uh, Julian Sonner that it can be understood from the ETH applied to, this, to these operators. The idea is that in energy basis, uh, you can expand it sort of like this, where F and G are smooth in the thermodynamic limit, and they contain information about the microcanonical one and two point functions. And then there are some random sort of coefficients here uh, that vanish on, upon averaging, but uh, add up to one when you have them squared. Then consistency with the semi-classical approximation gives us that F, F actually vanishes and gives some, some value for G. The important thing that, I want to, the thing that I want to highlight here is that if you recall the definition of our states and again, then try to compute the overlap using this ETH handsets, you find that you would get the average over these um, random coefficients, where importantly, they are coefficients for operators of different conformal dimension, very different conformal dimensions. And because these are not correlated when the conformal dimension is different, the expression vanishes. On the other hand, if you compute the overlap squared, you would get these expressions that don't actually vanish. So what this exercise tells us is that the semi-classical gravitational path interval is averaging over these erratic ETH coefficients. And it computes only the smooth part of the approximated quantities. So with this, with this, um, with this out of the way, let me uh, mention a specific limit where we can do computations and give very simple results. Uh, this is a very specific limit that we're taking that eases the computations, but the overall story that, I, that, I will, that I, I'm telling should be um, resilient to changes of this of this limit. So if we take the masses of the shells to be very, very large, the on-shell geometries pinch off. And what we end up getting is that things like the norm squared, the wormhole contributions, and higher boundary wormholes are simply given by partition functions with some, uh, some different um, inverse temperatures squared. And in general, the connected contribution to the nth moment of the overlaps is given by the partition function squared with uh, some n beta as inverse temperature. This can also be generalized to uh, setups where the temperatures are, are kept different between the two different sites, uh, in which case we, we, we get a product of partition functions. And we can also in include finite m corrections, so going away from this pinching limit that I was just describing. And the corrections look something like this, where these things can actually be uh, computed. 
Okay, so how do we then leverage this to compute the, the correct dimension of the Hilbert space that these states are spanning? What we want, basically want to say is that we want to build a family of states, which are these semi-classical uh, black hole microstates, where now the mass of the internal shell are going to be some multiple of some reference mass M0, which we take to be very large, just so that we can compute things very quickly, very easily. Another way of asking it, so the question is, what is the dimension of their span? Another way of phrasing this is, if we have this gram matrix, which is the matrix of overlaps between the states, what is the rank? If we, had, if we just do it brute force, like naively, by doing the semi-classical approximation of the gram matrix, we would find that it's just proportional to the identity. And we would wrongly say that the dimension is omega, even as omega becomes very large. However, we can do it in a, in a clever way by instead using this resolvent method. What we do is that we write this resolving matrix, which is a matrix that has poles whenever, whenever lambda is an eigenvalue of the, the matrix G. And this can be expanded as a power series in the, in the, in the, in the, in the overlaps. In the semi-classical approximation, what happens is that we have many, many, many different, um, ma many different eigenvalues. And moreover, we're doing a type of averaging, which make, makes them all sort of uh, get together, uh, sorry, get together and, and, tr and get a, we get a branch cut for the final expression. And then we get a, a continuous spectrum of density eigenstates given by the discontinuity across this branch cut. Okay, so we can compute this resolvent using the gravity path integral because, again, here this just gives us boundary conditions and we're supposed to take some, gra some type of gravity path integral to compute this quantity. And this can be done semi-classically by filling in the classically allowed uh, geometries and taking their own shell actions. Then we can do, one can do a standard sort of rearranging of these diagrams to get rid of the contributions that are disconnected like this at the cost of adding resolvents whenever there are some in lo loops in here. So you would get something that looks like this. Uh, this gives a schwinger dyson equation for the resolvent. And this is a semi-classical approximation of the resolvent, which looks something like this. Uh, and taking its trace, we get an expression uh, that looks like this. Now to solve this, what we're going to do is that instead of working in the canonical in a canonical uh, basis, we go to a microcanonical basis. What we do is that we project onto energy windows between E and E plus delta E, with delta E very small, doing an inverse Laplace transform. If we do this and we plug this expression into the Schrodinger Dyson equation, we get that the that it turns into a very simple quadratic equation. This can be solved, and then we get the the spectrum of this uh, eigenvalues which has a continuous part uh, between these two points. And once omega becomes bigger than e to the 2s, it gets a, a singularity at lambda equals 0, which is indicating that we're starting to get a lot of uh, null states in this list of states. And in, in particular, the gram matrix is degenerate. We can then use this to compute the, the rank of the gram matrix, and we find that as it increases, as omega increases, eventually it stops increasing. So the dimension of the silver space that we're spanning uh, just saturates. This indicates that this auxiliary Hilbert space that we defined by just making a list of these microcanonical states has converged into the true uh, microscopic, uh, sorry, microcanonical Hilbert space of the theory. Um, okay, so then we find that the maximum rank of the gram matrix is actually this <coughs> dimension of the microcanonical uh, subspace, and the actual value of S can be computed by evaluating the onshell action on the thermal disk and doing an inverse Laplace transform. It basically gives the beckinson hawking entropy. The factor of two is just from the fact that we're working on a double copy of the CFT. Sorry, that's not an integer. You said dimension of over space to be two x. Is that an integer? Um, no, it's a very large number in the seven classical approximation. Yes. Okay, so that's not how. So it's okay, so it's not using it, approximating something. That's why it's not an integer. I mean, dimension should be an integer. Right? Yes, yes, yes. It's, I think that's because of the semi classical approximation. It, you should be counting in Planck units, so it's an incredibly large number, you, and so the, the difference between that and an integer would be a very, very, very small. But, yeah. Okay. Um, right, so then we can generalize this to having asymmetric setups where we fix energy bands of different energy between the two sides. And I'll just mention that we get the same results where now we have the dimension is e to the sl plus sr where each of them is counting the dimension of uh, the respective uh, microcanonical Hilbert spaces. Okay, so very, very quickly I'll mention how this can then be leveraged to argue for factorization of the Hilbert space. 
the, this pulsar is basically because the bulk hover space is supposed to be the tensor product of the CFT left and CFT right. But from the bulk language, it's very, um, very uh, mysterious how this factorization would actually occur. Essentially because the, you can think of it as a tensor product of geometric states together with fluctuations around those geometric those geometries. And when these are connected, the silver space doesn't factorize in, into left and right. Um, so this was addressed in JT gravity by these, by these folks. And the idea is that this auxiliary Hilbert space that I was just describing, we can use it to compute the trace over operators, where these operators are supposed to be operators that act on the algebra of the right and left CFTs. In the bulk language, it means that th these are things that are localized on the entanglement wedges of the left and right asymptotic boundaries. For large enough lam uh, omega, this auxiliary Hilbert space converges to the true uh, Hilbert space, and we're going to find that there's a factorized expression that we get in the end. Uh, so this can be done by doing an analytic continuation of, ah, sorry. To compute this, we define this trace by taking this uh, matrix of overlaps and doing a generalized inverse. And then we can do the, do, we can compute it by doing analytic continuation of this expression, which is related to a complex contour of this thing over here, where now we have, once again, this, the same resolvent as before. This resolvent can then be computed using the semi-classical approximation in a, in, a, in a way similar to before. And in general, this would involve to computing two-point correlation functions in n-boundary wormhole geometries, which is quite complicated. But in the pinching limit, what we end up getting is that the geometries pinch off, and we instead get microcanonical one-point functions of, the, of these uh, operators. So we get an expression that looks like, a little bit like this, uh, where crucially we have traces of resolvents appearing here. And as I was mentioning earlier, once we start adding null states to our list and we have converged to the true microcanonical Hilbert space, uh, they develop a pole at lambda equals zero. And so this contour just picks up that pole, which gives us a factorized uh, expression, showing that this is actually uh, factorized. This is valid for operators that have dimension much less than M0, but because we took the microcanonical, the pinching limit, um, there's a large number of, of operators that satisfy this. So just to recap, uh, introduce this basis of semi-classical uh, black hole microstates and explain how one can leverage this information about small overlaps uh, containing the wormhole contributions to correctly find the, the Hilbert space dimension that they span. Then the fact that adding more sp uh, states to this list creates some null states, this can then be also used to show that uh, you can factorize at least some set of uh, operators in this theory. And lastly, this is, this is, even though I was focusing on a very specific construction, I think that the overall story here should be very um, resilient to changes in, in different setups. And in fact, has been explored in, in various other um, situations. Thank you. I, I didn't, didn't understand how your comments about the factorization puzzle are related to the original factorization puzzle, which was about the lack of factorization of the partition function on a disconnected boundary. Mm -hmm. Yes. Can you comment about this? Yes. So, so those are, as, as you were saying, those are two different factorization puzzles. One of them has to do with Euclidean observables in Euclidean gravity when they are living in different asymptotic boundaries. In this one, it's a more of a Lorentzian picture because if you do the Euclidean continuation of these, of these. Um, in, in Lorentzian, there is no factorization puzzle. There was never a problem with Lorentzian. Only Euclidean. In, in Lorentzian, you could have wormholes and they're fine. There was yeah. no problem with Euclidean. So the question in the Lorentzian example is how is it that the bulk Hilbert space factorizes? when you have states that, have, that connect the two asymptotic boundaries together with their fluctuations, and these are state things that clearly don't really have a factorized product, at least individually. The, 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 okay, the answer is that if you add enough of these connected geometries, you do get something that does factorize. But it's true that it's a different, um, it's a different question than the Euclidean factorization. No, I, I would say that the Lorentzian version never existed in the first place. Okay. I'm so sorry to ask about the dimension. I mean, the thing you call the thing you call dimension is just the density of state. It's a coarse grain density of states, right? It, that's what you mean by the yes. dimension here. It's yes. not well, uh, so this is all, by the way, yeah, this is all doing like leading order semi-classical computations. Uh, in reality, you could keep doing more and find more corrections to this quantity. Uh, but yes, it's basically the related to the microcanonical partition function, which is like density of states for a given energy. 
Okay, and the fact tracing you mentioned, you didn't actually exhibit the Hilbert space of the two. You didn't write the bulk Hilbert space as H A times H B, right? You just no. So it was just expanding as the span of these microcanonical semi-classical microstates that are just wormholes connecting the two asymptotic boundaries. Okay.